single choice that you made has led you this way so lay your head on me lay your head on me
Hi, welcome to the Youth Climate uh, Science Spotlight Speaker Series. We are so glad you could join us tonight. My name is Ellen and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a junior at Lake Placid High School in Northern New York. I'm tuning in to you today from occupied Haudenosaunee land. I am part of a team of students that is planning Youth Have Power and I'm here to get us started. You might have heard that Youth Have Power is a virtual adaptation of the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit, which would have been in its 12th year this November, held at the Wild Center in Northern New York. Since we can't be in person this year, I'm excited to welcome you all to this virtual space. Hi everyone, my name is Astrid and I use she, her pronouns. I'm also a junior at the Lake Placid High School. The Youth Climate Program is based out of the Wild Center, a new kind of science museum in the Adirondack Park in Northern New York. Check out our website to learn more about the Wild Center and learn about some otters that were just released to the wild. You're here because you registered for Youth Have Power. Youth Have Power is about learning how to take climate action with others, feeling connect connected to a larger community and creating space to talk about what's happening. Here's a recap of some Youth Have Power events over the past few weeks. Thank you to everyone who took part in our first Youth Have Power Climate Leader Weekend Challenge where students use ArcGIS to explore how their communities are responding to climate change. Shout out to Erica from California for sharing four submissions, the highest number of all participants. Another big thank you. Oops. Another big thank you to everyone who joined us for Unwind Climate Time DIY, DIY Night this past Wednesday. Shout out to the Young Scholars Cohort from Utica, New York, and our new friends from Nebraska. We had so much fun creating newspaper wigs, t-shirt bags, and recycled notebooks with you. I highly su suggest Unwind Climate Time. You can still register for Youth Have Power so you can join us at upcoming events. And you didn't get a chance to join last time? No worries. Join us this Saturday, October 24th from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next Climate Leader Weekend Challenge. Figure, figure out where the trash is in your community is coming, where the trash in your community is coming from and what you can do about it. Stay tuned for more information on how to share the climate action you've been working on this fall during our Solutions Showcase this December. More info coming soon. We also want to give a shout out to some of the youth cohorts from across the country that have been super engaged in Youth Have Power. Here's a youth cohort, cohort from DC that sent a video, hello. We are Climate Club DC, an organization of middle school students at Lowell School in Washington DC that connects students, teachers, and scientists across the country and all around the world who want to fight climate change through science education. Also, shout out to the Proctor Academy Young Scholars Program in Utica, New York. Here's a quick clip of this group. I would be in Young Scholars probably every day and just sitting with the staff members, working on schoolwork and talking about community service events. Being Young Scholars means to me like having a family to just go talk to. You can just walk in and like know half of the people in the room. I started going down to like Young Scholars classroom and like asking them for help. When I'm down there, I'm more happy. We are a Before we take a deeper dive into the science behind climate change, I wanted to acknowledge that we are all coming from different levels of experience and comfort talking about climate change. While you don't have to be a climate scientist to understand the basics of climate change, it's important for us all to understand how the science behind climate change works. However, it is important for all youth climate leaders to hear these words from Shie Bestida, an 18-year-old climate activist and organizer for Fridays for Our Future. Uh, this is a quote from her. Here's what I've learned. You don't need to know all the details of the science to be a part of the solution. And if you wait until you know everything, it will be too late for you to do anything. 
That's why we, the youth who are leading on climate, are calling this an emergency. Youth have come to understand that we have to be the communicators of science, facts, policy, solutions, and hope through language that reaches the general public. We have to use every tool at our disposal, from traditional media to memes, to tell the world what we know and why it matters to us. Now, before we turn it over to our keynote speakers, we're going to do a quick review of the basic science behind climate change. Take it away, Ellen. Global, oops. Global warming refers only to the Earth's rising surface temperature, while climate change includes warming and the many other effects of warming, like melting glaciers, heavier rainstorms, or more frequent drought. Another way to phrase it would be global warming is one symptom of the much larger problem of human-caused climate change. At its most basic, climate change is caused by a change in the Earth's energy balance. And how much of the energy from the sun that enters the Earth and its atmosphere is released back into space. Energy from the sun comes to Earth in the form of light. That energy is absorbed by the Earth and warms it. Some of that energy is re-radiated from the Earth in the form of heat. Some of that outgoing heat is trapped by the atmosphere, which is a good thing. It has kept our planet at a stable temperature. Now, however, humans have been thickening the atmosphere by filling it with heat trapping pollution. More heat energy is trapped and it is warming our planet at an unprecedented rate. This has been understood by scientists since the 1800s. Another way to think about the greenhouse effect is like a heat trapping blanket. Carbon dioxide emitted by human activity builds up in the atmosphere to create a blanket around the earth that traps more heat. Our planet is getting warmer and 97% of scientists agree that climate change is happening now. It is being driven primarily by human activity and we can do something to reduce its impacts and progression. Human activities have added very large quantities of greenhouse gases into Earth's atmosphere and the global temperatures have risen dramatically. This graph shows how the average global temperature of the Earth's surface has been consistently above average since the 1980s and has gotten significantly warmer in recent years. Nineteen of the 20 hottest years ever measured with instruments have occurred since 2001 and the hottest year of all was 2016. There are many sources of human-caused global warming pollution, agricultural practices, forest burning, transportation, and many other factors. But the main source and cause of the rising global temperatures we are seeing today is the burning of fossil fuels, which provide more than 80% of the world's energy. This pollution has caused the Earth to warm, to warm almost twice as fast as its rate of warming during the previous century. The rising temperatures are causing wet areas to become more wet and dry areas to become more dry. Drought combined with high temperatures has fueled the wildfires in the western U.S. that you may have seen or experienced this summer and fall. At the same time, Warmer air and ocean temperatures mean storms and hurricanes are becoming more powerful, which has caused this season to be one of the most active hurricane seasons on record in the Atlantic. Our thoughts are with everyone who has been impacted by climate fuel disaster this year, particularly the low income and marginalized communities that are bearing the brunt of these impacts. We know this is a lot and it is layered on many other crises this year that are affecting our lives and demanding our attention. I'd like to everyone to take a deep breath with me before we introduce the keynote speakers. All right. With that, I am excited to hear more about climate science from our keynote speakers. Later this evening, we will hear from Liza Goldberg, a student research assistant at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and a first year student at Stanford University. She began her research at NASA at age 14 and employs remote sensing to monitor global mangrove ecosystem vulnerability. Liza also leads Space Scope, 
an education initiative with Google Earth to bring satellite analysis to K through 12 classrooms worldwide. Using space technology, she seeks to revolutionize communication of climate change and human environment interactions for the next generation. Liza is a National Geographic young explorer and her research has been recognized in films by Google Incorporated and now this, as well as publications in the Washington Post, Scholastic Science World, and Google's The Keyword. Wow. Now, I'm excited to introduce, <laughs> I'm excited to introduce Dr. Leslie Ann Dupini Giroux, who is a professor of climatology in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont. She uses remotely sensed data to do statistics and historical content analysis to explore the influence of atmospheric processes on fluvial processes and vegetated landscapes. She researches climate hazards and severe weather with a special focus on flooding and droughts. As a state climatologist for Vermont, she engages directly with community groups, K through 12 schools, state legislators, federal and state agencies and national climate organizations. She is the president of the American Association of State Climatolo Climatologists, a fellow of the American Meteorology Society and the Northeast chapter lead author of the fourth National Climate Assessment. All right, Leslie, you can take it away. Well, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And thank you to Astrid and um, Ellen for that very, very gracious introduction here. Okay, so if everybody's seeing my slides, okay, can I get a quick sound check that everything looks okay before I get going? Looks great. Awesome, thank you kindly, Erin. All right, so thank you so much to the Wild Center for the, um, the invitation to actually be part of this, this really, really awesome series. And just listening to um, Ellen and, and Astrid go before me, it's actually amazing. Um, all of the things that have been going on and taking place over the last X number of years. And so what I'm gonna do is to, to hopefully piggyback on a lot of the things that um, you just heard in terms of Climate Science 101 and talk a little bit about what it means to, to bring this from the, the local level, from the school level that you've been working on all the way up to the national level across the entire US, affiliated islands, the US Caribbean, in what was called the National Climate Assessment. So I'll spend most of my time talking a little bit about that, but I'll also spend a little bit of time um, sort of touching back on what, what Ellen and Astrid were just talking about with the multiple layers of other crises that are taking place within this year. And so make a little bit of a mention about COVID-19 and how that plays into um, the ongoing work that we're doing about climate and, and climate change. And then at the very end, I have a little bit of a pivot that will sort of um, lead into some of the things that Liza is gonna be talking about. So just to, to, to sort of think about all of the ways in which we've heard about climate change affecting us as, as human beings, some of the, the visuals, and I use a lot of remote sensing satellite images in, in my work and in my teaching. And so it, it's natural for me to sort of use the examples that are actually from remote sensing. And so um, stories that you may have heard in, in the not so distant past include things like um, Cape Town in South Africa. The, the water supplies there were actually dwindling as a result of ongoing drought that was um, exacerbated by, by a change in climate and the fact that they might have run out of, of water. So that's one of the impacts that we have seen in the past. And then this year, as we saw in some of the things that Ellen and, and Astro were talking about, uh, wildfires in the West, wildfires in California, wildfires in Alaska, wildfires in Siberia, and how those are, again, impacts and symptoms of, of our changing climate. And this is, this is not something new. This has been ongoing. And so it has a number of different um, impacts that are not just um, forestry-related that are not just changing the local climate every time uh, a patch of forest on the Earth's surface burns down. Something else that we, we, we look at are all of the different ways that we as a, a planet 
sort of come together and all of the, the various ecosystems that continue to be um, changed or impacted in some way as a result of our changing climate, including our marine life, including uh, places in our desert regions, and especially things like human health. So again, looking at how do we understand this, why does it matter, what are we um, going to do in terms of some potential for action. I know that's what a lot of, of you who are listening right now are particularly concerned about and particularly spending uh, uh, most of your energy um, in, in terms of making a difference. So one thing that I like to do whenever I give a presentation is to show this animation. And it comes from the NASA Science Visualization Studio, or SVS. So that's the NASA Science Visualization Studio. And what they've done with this, before I play it, is they've gone back and gotten all of the records from 1880, which is when about um, a lot of our climate records start, the, the written records, that is, and then brought them all the way through to the present. And the last full year of records that we have, of course, is 2019. So what you're going to be seeing as I play this, this animation for you is the animation is going to move forward in five-year chunks. And as it, as it does that, it's comparing it to an average time frame that goes from 1960 to 1991. So we're looking to see how the change in those five-year time frames occurs. And the way that you're reading it is the blue values are colder than the average, and the yellows, the oranges, and the reds are warmer than the average. And as you're looking at this, what you're going to see is exactly what, what Ellen and Astrid said in terms of that 1980 period being a time when things really started to ramp up. So let me play this for you. I play it in, in silence so that you can actually see the power of this particular visualization. Here comes 1980. Okay, so what, what you saw is a number of different things in here. You saw colder versus warmer, and then around 1980, when everything really started to shift, you saw that pronounced warming taking place across most of the entire world, and a couple of places that are still a little bit cold up, like parts of Antarctica, some cold blobs in North Atlantic, some cold blobs across in the Pacific itself. So. I, I always love to use this particular animation, like I said, to, to, to get that visual of that amplification, that acceleration, that speeding up of, of, of climate change as a result of, of human activity. So let's, let's do a little bit more of the, the Climate Science 101 that um, Ellen Astrid did such an awesome job on with looking to see how this kind of plays out. So. I'm a geographer by training, and so everything for me has to have a sort of spatial piece to it. And so I like to see how all the pieces of the puzzle kind of fit together. So, you know, we heard about all of that energy coming to us from the sun, and then what happens when it hits the earth and, and causes things like clouds to form, and where do those clouds rain, and how does that rain get into rivers and streams and ponds, and if there isn't enough, you have things like droughts, and if you have too much, you have things like floods taking place, and then as all of that gets into the oceans, how do the oceans um, store not just moisture, but heat as a result of our, our changing um, patterns and then how does this all sort of feedback and continue the cycle so for me everything is a system climate is a system so when when we look at all of these areas pieces the clouds the water the um, energy the vegetation the the moisture patterns all of that is how we think about climate and then changes in in all of those are how we think about our climate change. And so whether it's changes in, in how much energy is being moved across the Earth's surface, whether it's changes in things like your winds, whether who gets more rainfall, who gets less rainfall, whether there's warming taking place, whether we have 
um, changes in soil moisture, so we have droughts occurring, whether we see more pollution in the atmosphere, so does the atmospheric chemistry change, how do your ecosystems respond, all of those are parts of thinking of climate change as a system, so it's all connected, okay, and, and that's why you're seeing all of these arrows on here, sort of like either crisscrossing or going back and forth, because they're all sort of connected to each other. So, when we, we, we think about um, the various ways in which we can try to understand climate change, uh, this is one of my favorite diagrams because it, it helps me to think about whether as a scientist, I'm, I'm trying to work through climate change from the causes, which is what you see on this left-hand side here. So whether it's, it's changes in, in your greenhouse gases, whether it's changes in land use, whether it's changes in how much industrial um, processes are taking place. And then as all of these causes of the changes then start to result in impacts, are we seeing things like, um, ocean acidification? Are we seeing things like sea level rises? Are we seeing things like um, bird species arriving earlier or in places where they had never been before? And so that's a crossing in, 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 in this region here. Are you seeing things like uh, harmful algal blooms sort of blossoming in places where they, they've, they've never taken place or are they worse than they usually are? And then the last piece in all of this is what sorts of actions, what sort of responses are we taking to address climate change? So are we trying to mitigate against ongoing feedback processes or are we trying to adapt to these changes or are we doing both? And so when we look at it, 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 it helps to, to, to sort of um, understand which of the three parts of, of, of looking at, at climate change we're, we're talking about, whether it's process-wise, impact-wise, or strategy-wise, because it just helps you um, hone your message just a little bit more in terms of that place that you're speaking from. And so when, when we look at this, and we're just looking at this um, you, um, graphically for a sec here, um, this part in here, we see part C, where we see either like an increase over time or decrease over time. That's one of the things that we usually tend to associate with climate change is the steady increase or steady decrease. And if you, if you think about some of the classes that you may have taken, for example, if you've been fortunate enough to take a geology class, uh, you may have seen, if you go back millions of years, you can see big jumps in the record. And that's another way that we can look at, at our change in climate. The one that I, as a, a geographer, like to spend um, a lot of time looking at is this last one here. And what it shows you is that, you know, fluctuations over time. So we can think of them as um, more high temperatures, more low temperatures, or more heat waves, more cold waves, or more floods and more droughts. And so what, what we're seeing is, is those fluctuations um, around a, an average value. And as you look at it, those, those fluctuations are getting bigger and bigger. So think about heat waves in parts of Europe in 2003, for example, or think about how some places tend to have really, really severe floods at one time of the year, and then they go into really, really severe drought. And the, the, the challenge with all of that is we as, as human beings, we as human societies have evolved to live in a very narrow band. And that's where we thrive really, really well within that narrow band. And that's what these red lines here are showing you, those thresholds. And so once we get over that, once it goes beyond those thresholds, that's where we start to become even more vulnerable because it's outside of that range that we have been um, used to being in. And so that, that's why when you have increased um, heat waves or increased droughts and floods, that's where you start seeing an increase in, in, in human vulnerability. And that's where social justice, environmental justice sort of comes into play because we're now getting into the margins of where um, populations are vulnerable. So let me, with that as a background, talk a little bit about um, the National Climate Assessment for which I was um, privileged fortunate enough selected as the, the lead author on this particular chapter. And the National Climate Assessment um, comes out of uh, a U.S. congressional mandate. Uh, the U.S. congressional um, mandate created an act in 1990 that says that 
every four years, we should be going back over and looking to see um, what we have learned about climate change and putting it together in um, uh, a volume that allows all of the US public to be able to understand the latest advances in climate change. So the National Climate Assessment is designed to assist policy. So that's why it says here policy relevant, but it's, it's not supposed to be prescriptive. What that means is the, the assessment cannot say you must be doing this particular activity and you, you shall do this and you shan't do that. It's not, it's not allowed to, to, to do that but it, it, it is used by policymakers. It is used by various agencies to assist them with the various um, climate action plans, climate change responses that they're, they're looking at. And so this is supposed to be every four years or so. And if you um, listen to, to the, the, the numbers, 1990 to, to 2020, and we've done four. So, when the fourth climate assessment came out, it was the very first time that we had actually met the mandate to do this every four years. And so that's why we were so excited when it was released in 2018, because for the first time we'd actually met the, the mandate um, as, as put forth by Congress. And so you see a number of, of authors from, from the Northeast who worked on the chapter, um, including Dr. Dave Reed Miller, who, is the, who was the head of the entire assessment for the, the fourth cycle. So with much joy, we visited the Smithsonian and actually got to interact um, with a number of, of other scientists at the American Geophysical Union in, um, uh, in DC when we celebrated the, the 100th anniversary. And I know that there are a number of, of folks who are on right now who are actually going to be attending the AGU this year in 2020. So it, it's nice to, to sort of come full circle in that. So for, 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 for you who may be interested in looking to see what is specific to your state what I'm gonna invite you to do is to, to, to Google for me, state climate summary, because each state in, in the US actually has a four page document that talks about what climate change looks like for your particular state, okay? And so for, for Vermont, I just took a little screenshot of what, what some of those specific things are. So it says state climate summary for Vermont and it goes through um, precipitation, it goes through Lake Champlain and all of the various pieces that um, are very, very iconic and therefore critically important to uh, the state of Vermont. And when we were creating the, the chapter for the, the Northeast, one of the things that they asked us to do was to think about what are some pieces that are unique to your region. So for, for us who live in the Northeast, there are a couple of things. The, the fact that we have a, a very um, big dichotomy between um, a lot of uh, urban areas, which are uh, largely along the coast. So we've got the megalopolis starts off in Boston and goes all the way down through New York and into Jersey, all the way down into DC. So we've got a very urban corridor, but we also have a strong influence of, of rural areas in here. And so we've got that rural urban dynamic taking place. We also have a, a very important region along the coast, the, the Northeast continental shelf. And so we've got that inland versus coastal um, Di dichotomy also in place. The Northeast was um, perhaps the earliest settled across the, the, the US in terms of um, non-Indigenous peoples arriving into the region. And so there are parts of the, um, the heritage of the Northeast that um, set it apart from places where um, people arrived later. So the, the, the cultural heritage is a little bit different because of that length of settlement. And then the last piece that we can look at is the fact that we have the Adirondacks running through a lot of our region. And so there are these mountain and valley um, region and, 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 and lowland regions that make the climate and therefore climate change very different in, in, in our region. So to help us with that, there were a number of, of new products that were created and so, um, the National Climate Assessment can sometimes be a little bit um, dense and compact because there's so much wonderful stuff in place. And so 
one of the things I want to do today is, is to maybe show you what some of those pieces are that you can use. And so one of the new pieces is that for the first time ever, we actually had economic information. So labor statistics, air quality statistics, how do changes in bad air quality days affect the number of hours that people can work? Okay, so for the first time, we can actually put a number to that as a climate change impact. And in thinking about the National Climate Assessment, they asked us to use what's called a risk-based framing, which means who is at risk? What is at risk? How do you know that, that these communities or these um, sectors of our economy are at risk? Okay, and what are the tipping points beyond which it becomes particularly um, hazardous or particularly bad for the economy or bad for human health? And then what are some of the things that we can do to mitigate or to adapt to those, those changes? And then the, the big question, the kicker in here is how bad could it possibly get? Okay, and, and what are some of those sort of like points of no return that we can um, think about? And so that was the thinking that we used to actually create um, the, the chapters that we wrote. And this was not done in, in isolation, we actually had a number of workshops across the various regions where um, we, we had uh, folks sort of tell us, what, what are you working on in your community? What is important to you? What are some of the pieces that we wanna make sure that we don't miss? And so all of these dots on here are places where folks came together to actually provide a lot of that input. And so on this slide, which you cannot read because there is way too much stuff going on and the font is too small. What it shows you are the sort of um, talking points, the highlights for each region in looking at it. So whether it's water, whether it's energy, whether it's agriculture, whether it's flash drought, whether it's hurricanes, all those pieces sort of come together in, in, in helping us to understand what climate change looks like across the US, uh, Hawaii, the affiliated Pacific Islands, the US Caribbean, Alaska. And I had to do a presentation like this uh, about two years ago. And so I actually went through and read all of the executive summaries for the 10 regions that uh, make up the, the US um, National Climate Assessment. I thought, you know, they've there'd be things that are different in each one. But surprisingly, there were these same themes, these same pieces that ran through pretty much all of the chapters. And they included things like um, human health. They included things like the impact of climate change on indigenous peoples, um, the productivity of our agricultural regions, the fact that transportation and infrastructure are particularly vulnerable. Um, how are ecosystem services changing? And then for the, the, the parts that have a coast, we had things like changes in sea level rise and changes in the various resources that um, our, our coastal communities actually depend on. So some of these are sort of um, specific to some regions, but they're also sort of overarching. So let's talk about the five main things that came out of the, the, the sort of um, messaging for the Northeast. And the first message um, had to do with the, the, the largely rural parts of the Northeast and the way in which a lot of the changes in seasons, whether it's changes in the timing of um, when spring comes, whether it's changed in, in terms of how mild the winter is, whether, whether it's changes in the actual economies that depend on, on all of these different seasons, how are those changes sort of moving forward? Because they affect things like tourism in the region, we're in the middle of fall foliage season, and so looking to see how climate change affects that. Um, looking to see how it affects things like your snowpack, uh, that's important for the ski industry and, and so forth. And so again, why did we focus on, on rural as uh, one of those first key messages in there? Well, it has to do with the land mass that, um, it, that's involved in here and where the populations are in our, our rural parts of the landscape. And so in, in looking at these changes in seasons, that then begs the question, if the seasons are changing, what does that mean for agricultural productivity and, 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 and sort of thriving in the Northeast itself? And so what we are looking at here is 
things like when did the um, freeze occur for the last time in the spring, when did it occur for the first time in the fall, because in between is our growing season. And the growing season, whether it's getting longer and how long will that be at different points in time. So we've got middle of the century and then end of the century. And again, the color scheme is the, the, the darker the color, the more the change. So any place that you see reds and, and maroons would be larger changes in the length of your growing season, which sets up um, the question of how a th crop's gonna thrive, will we need to depend on different types of crops and so forth. The other part of all of this is, is of course, looking at our, our changes in um, when things occur from a snowmelt stream flow perspective and how that affects us in Northeast in terms of getting earlier and earlier. So the second key message went along with the first one and it talks about um, ecosystems from a coastal perspective because um, the waters off the coast of, of the Northeast are changing faster, they're warming faster, ocean acidification is more of a, a challenge than it is in the other places that have um, coastal uh, resources across the U.S. And so the, the coastal element and the, the, the habitats, the, the livelihoods and the various ecosystem services that are part of those are critically important. And part of that has to do with our changes in sea level rise, whether it's from a um, a biophysical perspective, so islands that are, are close to the coast, barrier islands, but also from an infrastructural perspective as well. The third key message looks at urban areas because we've got that urban rural, you can't have urban without rural and vice versa. And the mere fact that we have some of the, the, the largest, oldest and most culturally significant um, urban regions um, in the Northeast um, behooves us to actually look at, at what climate change means for, for some of those cities. So for example, flooding in Annapolis in Maryland and what that means for um, productivity, tourism and um, socioeconomic um, thriving in that particular place. And, and then what are some of the, 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 the things that occur as an adaptation or mitigation to some of the things that we're already seeing. So for example, Hurricane Sandy in, in New York flooded a lot of the, um, the subways. And so in response to that, uh, the city of New York actually has these new ways of um, having grates over the, the entry. So it's a little bit higher. So that acts as a mitigation against the water getting into the subway, but then they're multifunctional, multipurpose in that um, they can function as bus stops, but also for um, urban cyclists who might wanna park there. The fourth key message looks at um, human health and the way in which we are, are, are noticing changes in things like emergency room visits. Um, our populations uh, span from uh, West Virginia all the way up to Maine. And so um, we are acclimated to different types of climate. And so any changes in water quality, air quality, sea level rise are all gonna be critically important for our populations across the region. And one way to kind of put your finger on that pulse is to see are there changes in um, emergency room visits for a number of reasons, including um, increase in heat waves. And then the final key message talks about all of that wonderful work that's taking place across the entire Northeast with looking at some of those um, adaptation um, strategies that have been in place for, for what things like Reggie or other types of more local scale um, sort of adaptation um, techniques and how we can sort of bundle, bundle those together and to showcase and highlight them. So the folks who worked on, on the Northeast chapter are given to you on here. Um, we also had folks who did some technical contributions, including some students, and you see those folks listed on here. And then if you want us to read more about the, um, the, the National Climate Assessment, we've got that piece in here. Okay, so let me pivot um, and just point out a couple of things that are, are key pieces for the National Climate Assessment. Um, one big thing, and this, this slide has way too many words on it, but one big thing that comes out of this is in order to, to sort of reduce all of these risks that are being posed by climate change, the strategy has to look like this, okay? So there has to be 
all of the sort of coming together and mitigative and adaptative work at the global and, and national scale, but there's also the work that needs to be done at the local scale. And they sort of have to bubble up in the case of the local, but also come top down in the case of your global. And so those pieces need to come together if we're going to sort of move the needle, move the dial in terms of um, preparing for mitigating against ongoing climate change. So there are two additional chapters that I'm going to point out to you. The first one is chapter 29, of the National Climate Assessment that talks all about mitigation. And you can see all of these dots on here are dots that represent some type of mitigation activity across the US. And they can include things like transportation or energy efficiency or changes in land use or different types of cap and trade types agreements. And when you look at that, that figure, figure 29.1, you can see where your state fits in terms of where its various measures are. Second um, chapter that I'm going to point out to you is the one just before chapter 28, because chapter 28 looks at adaptation. So 29 is mitigation, 28 is adaptation. And the nice part about this is one of my favorite diagrams, by the way. The nice part about this is that it shows you that all of that work that we had started to do in 2014 was sort of realized, it was coming online and is now on, on board in 2018. So you can actually talk about what are some of those um, investments that actually paid off. So chapter 28 goes into some of these in a little bit more detail. And so everybody, ears perk up. The fifth national climate assessment has started. And so they're looking for your input. And if you have any reports, any sort of case studies, anything that you want to submit, please, please, please just Google fifth national climate assessment and go to this link in here so that you can actually submit the various pieces that you have been working on that all of the folks who are going to be writing this for the next time around would love to hear about. So let's do a quick pivot here. Um, I know we're running out of, of time, at least for, for my, my 30 minutes here. So let's do a quick pivot and talk about a climate change pandemic. Is it either or the answer is no, because these are overlapping, these are intersecting challenges that you can't leave one to the side and take care of the other. So we've seen these um, highlights. We've seen these um, news stories where we're looking at um, hurricanes in, in the West and sorry, hurricanes in the, in, in the Southern parts of the, the US, fires in the West, COVID-19 and how does this all sort of pull, pull together and so, um, the World Meteorological Organization has just put out a report that does an awesome job in talking about how do we understand the vulnerabilities that are posed not just by climate change, not just by COVID-19, but together, because what COVID-19 has done is to sort of heighten or to peel back the, the, the veil on a lot of the, the vulnerabilities, social justice, environmental justice issues that are also um, part of the, the, the things that we look at when we talk about our change in climate. So here's a, a, um, uh, the report that the European Union has actually created as a strategy for looking at climate change adaptation. And again, COVID-19 is front and center because you cannot separate those two out in, in looking at this. So some of the things that we saw over the last few months is uh, when we had the shutdown and everybody was at home, there was no industrial practices taking place, we saw a decrease in one of the key um, greenhouse gases that leads to climate change, nitrogen dioxide, we saw it drop off. And so um, large concentrations is what tends to occur. So this is the northern part of the country of Italy. But during the shutdown, we saw that dramatic fall in your nitrogen um, dioxide. Same story for the Northeast. So we've got the, the sort of traditional concentration again along the, the industrial urban regions in here. This is the average values. Again, dark colors show you high amounts. And then with everything being shut down, you saw again that very, very dramatic drop off in this particular greenhouse gas, your nitrogen dioxide. Now, that's only part of the story because as soon as, as, as we reopened and went back, those values actually started to increase again. And one of the largest reasons is because 
nitrogen dioxide responds very quickly to the weather. And so the changes that we thought we accrued from a climate change perspective were actually very, very short lived because of how dependent this gas is on weather conditions. And so as soon as everything went back to reopening, you saw a rebound in this particular greenhouse gas. And so if I were to try and put all of this together to explain all of these various changes in, in gases like nitrogen dioxide, one way of doing that would be to use what's called um, science on a sphere. And I know the Wild Center is fortunate enough to actually have one of these. Makes me kind of jealous because now I want to visit. And so if you do have the opportunity to see a science on a sphere, it, it's a spinning type of um, visualization that allows you to see all of these various ways in which uh, wind flow patterns and ocean currents, uh, changes in your temperature actually play out across the entire globe. And if you can't go to a center that has it, a company called iGlobe actually makes them in a, in a small enough format that you can have either on a cart or to bring into your, into your classroom itself. So if, if, if this is something that might be of interest, we can chat a little bit later. All right, so I've, I've talked a lot about all of these various pieces of, of climate change. And so let me just pull back and, and highlight some things that I want you to sort of walk away from with all of this. First and foremost, um, it's people, okay? And so for me as a geographer, the who's vulnerable is critically important. Who's vulnerable in terms of being able to access all of this information? Who's vulnerable because if you hear that you need to shelter in place, how do you do that if you don't have a home, okay? What about access to healthcare? So there's all of these aspects of vulnerability that are critically important. We can't look at any of this without looking at it from all of the various perspectives. And so if I had to give you one word apart from vulnerability, it would be systems because everything has to fit together at multiple scales and multiple times to actually take a look at this. And all of these various um, disciplines and um, ways of understanding and, and various types of knowledges need to come together for us to, to work with this. And information is coming at us from all over. So we need to be flexible and nimble and quick in being able to, to see what the, the additional pieces are, because I have complete um, confidence in us as, as human beings and us as, as a species in terms of how do we learn to be, continue to be resilient. And so with that, um, I thank you for your t attention. If you need to get a hold of me for anything, here's my email address. There's the, um, the URL for the National Climate Assessment again. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Erin or maybe over to Liza. Thank you so much, Dr. Dupini Giroux. You covered a lot of territory and I just wanna remind all the folks that are watching on the live stream that Feel free to comment right in YouTube if you have questions. We are totally open and excited to hear your questions and hear what you're thinking after all this. So please go ahead and um, put your comments right in the YouTube stream and then we'll actually get those questions to our presenters um, right at the end, right at around in the next 15 minutes or so. So um, if you're like feeling a little bit overwhelmed by anything you heard, don't worry. Um, both our presenters will be available to answer those questions after. Um, so again, thank you so much. And I'm actually gonna turn it over to our next speaker, Liza Goldberg. Hi everyone, my name is Liza. Thank you, Erin, so much for the introduction. I'm really excited to be with all of you today. Um, and to talk a little bit about, you know, now that we know the science of climate change, what are the best ways of actually communicating climate um, to the broader public and other students? Um, so with that, I will share my screen. Can I get a quick confirmation from Erin that it's working? Yep, it looks good. Okay, great. Um, so as was mentioned, my name is Liza. I am a um, student researcher at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, just north of Washington, DC. And I'm also a freshman at Stanford University, unfortunately doing college from afar, as I know uh, many of you are as well who are listening. Um, and I'm also a member of the Google Earth Engine team, which I'll get into a little bit later. So just to start out, as you've heard from the past couple presentations, most of us know our planet is in pretty grave danger. 
When we look at the news, we see headlines like this from the New York Times, or like this one from the Guardian, or like this from the Washington Post. And when we put together all of these headlines that we're seeing on a daily, monthly, or yearly basis, we see we have a pretty clear consensus here. We should be alarmed. But why is it that we aren't alarmed? Why is it that we see these headlines and read these statistics and still the general public still does not necessarily view climate change as something that's going to imminently impact us either now or within our lifetimes? I think the answer actually falls within the realm of COVID-19. Over the last couple of months, the same thing has happened with COVID in terms of this complete influx of news articles about this one particular issue, of course, on a shorter time scale than climate change. Um, but the key here is this, it's the people. Because with COVID, the key is that we're actually able to see the visible impacts of the disease on our neighbors, people in our household, our families and our communities as a whole. And so far with climate change, that hasn't been uh, necessarily the case in the Northeast. Although from the last presentation, you've heard that climate change definitely does have lasting impacts and already has had impacts on various aspects of, um, of daily lives for people in the United States. Um, ultimately, the impacts of climate thus far and in the near future have been most concentrated in other regions of the world, um, specifically developing nations in particular um, focused on the Southeast Asia region, um, Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. For example, in Bangladesh, we're able to see the lasting impacts of um, sea level rise and flooding along the coastal towns, um, pushing thousands of residents further inland and overcrowding capital cities um, as they move to migrate away from the um, impending threat of sea level rise. In Sub-Saharan Africa in 2019, five countries faced among the most significant droughts that we've seen in recent history, um, greatly exacerbating um, continuous food security issues that we see in the region over time. And then finally, most of us are very familiar with the Puerto Rican crisis following um, several recent hurricanes um, as increasing um, climate change impacts, um, rising frequency of extreme weather events. We'll see these um, sorts of impacts um, both in tropical regions like Puerto Rico and across the world. But the problem here is that although we can empathize with these populations whose lives have been completely upended by climate change, again, until we kind of see these impacts with our own eyes in our own communities, chances are most people aren't necessarily going to be convinced that climate change is a crisis that we need to take action about um, right here and now to um, make a better future for ourselves and future generations. So what's kind of the answer to that? At least part of the answer might fall in the realm of satellite imagery. Using satellites, we're able to get a continuous assessment of how Earth is doing, um, both in historical times and, and also uh, looking at current times and into the future. Here, for example, you're able to see the continuous impacts of deforestation and conversion of the Amazon rainforest to agriculture around Giro Dam in Brazil. Across the world, we can see in Las Vegas, the impacts of urbanization on water supply in this lake immediately adjacent to the city and how that's changing over time. We can see in the Great Salt Lake region of Utah, the impacts of continued um, agriculture and overuse of water in the um, Plains region and for agriculture and how that's impacting water supply um, in this particular lake and the communities that surround it. And finally, we can see this really interesting um, visual example of how Dubai is expanding over time and how that's impacting the ocean and other coastal ecosystems in the region. So using these examples, you can see how satellites can get down into really any community across the world and monitor both how climate change is impacting um, populations and ecosystems and also how humans themselves are directly modifying the environment. So, how do we actually get access to the satellite imagery? How can any of the students in the audience um, start to manage and, and analyze some of these data for themselves? Right now, there are about 3,000 active satellites currently orbiting Earth. Here you're just seeing some examples of current NASA missions um, that we actively use um, at NASA Goddard, but other satellite imageries like ESA and JAXA from other nations across the world are also working together to get a continuous assessment of how Earth is doing from space. 
Now, how do we actually access this data? these data. There are a lot of different ways, ultimately, of getting access to the satellite data that um, we can find in any corner of the world. But today, I want to focus on one specific tool called Google Earth Engine, um, which many people are saying is really the future of remote sensing. Earth Engine is a planetary scale platform for actually gathering the satellite imagery and analyzing it um, for understanding various aspects of, of human environmental change. Essentially, how Earth Engine works, it's essentially the back end of the Google Earth platform that you're probably familiar with. Google is able to enter into contracts with NASA and other satellite companies around the world, and they then store all of these satellite data that these companies collect in Google server farms out in California. So whenever a, a scientist or user of Google Earth Engine wants to get their precipitation data over their local region, they can essentially um, call Google's servers using some internet queries, um, and the server will give them back the satellite data um, over the cloud. So this is a really efficient way of now distributing the satellite data that was previously restricted to just government and academic institutions to anyone in the world um, who's interested in getting access to these data. So what kind of data are we talking about here? Well, we have Landsat 5 through 8 data. Landsat is a pretty iconic satellite that makes up um, a good portion of the typical satellite imagery that you see in programs like Google Maps and Google Earth. Um, and it's able to give us a continuous archive from 1984 to the present um, on various aspects of Earth's terrain and how it's changed over time. Through Earth Engine, we're also able to get access to things like temperature data. Um, starting from the 1950s, we have this continuous archive of how Earth's temperature has changed over time. And in turn, using tools like Earth Engine, we're able to project how that temperature will impact different communities, both now and far into the future. We also increasingly have access to super high resolution data using Earth Engine. We're now able to get to the one to three meter resolution imagery on almost all corners of the world. Um, allowing us to really get down to the local level in terms of assessing these types of environmental and human impacts. We also have other aspects of climate data that I haven't covered so far, like precipitation, for example, and extreme weather events um, to track how those sorts of long-term and shorter-term climatic changes could impact your community or any other community across the world. So how does this actually work? Um, if you're interested afterwards, um, I'd be happy to go into more detail here, but the general idea here is that you're able to, again, call Google servers um, using this Earth Engine interface here that you see on my screen. You're then able to actually process the satellite data using JavaScript coding and then visualize um, how those data actually look um, in your community and across the world. But there's a really big problem here, and it's that in order to analyze these satellite data here in Google Earth Engine, you need to have at least some level of coding, which is a big problem if we're talking about actually distributing these data and the analyses that come along with it um, to the broader public and students across the world. So in order to fill up that gap, I recently launched a program called SpaceScope, um, which seeks to directly put the satellite data that we're able to access in Google Earth Engine to the public and students um, across the world. Using SpaceScope, we're creating a series of apps that allow students to investigate various aspects of these global environmental changes for themselves, all housed within this one website um, that you see here. For example, we have an Amazon fire mapping app where students are able to actually go into the Amazon and see the impact of um, both the Amazon fires over the past several years, um, as well as how that potentially impacts the deforestation extent over time and what relationships we can find between those two variables. We also have an app looking at the impact of climate on Earth's water supply and how changes in human land use um, across the world could impact things like droughts um, and water scarcity moving forward into the future, as you can see on these maps. We also have an urbanization explorer where students are actually able to go into any city across the world and see how population and nightlight trends have changed over time with increasing patterns of urbanization. We have simple before and after change apps as well, like this global ice melt hotspot app where we're able to really clearly see changes um, between an earlier period and a later period um, as sort of an easy means of comparison of how global environmental changes are impacting certain hotspots. 
And then finally, we have more cumulative apps like this global human influence mapping app where we're able to track um, multiple factors at once, like the built up density of different cities, population density, or things like agriculture or aquaculture across the world. So we're currently um, building up dozens of these apps using a team of scientists from NASA, Google, and also National Geographic. Um, but today, I actually want to finish with a call for any of you who are interested to potentially join the Space Scope team. Um, whether you're a student or a teacher, we're really interested in hearing your opinion and your input um, in terms of both app and website design and also curriculum development in terms of how we can move forward and um, potentially incorporate these satellite-based analyses into ecology and biology classrooms. Um, really specifically in high schools, but also in middle schools across the US and across the world. Um, we also have the potential for um, potentially stipend paid or also volunteer relatively low time commitment positions um, to tackle these different challenges with us. Um, so I really encourage you to email me uh, just directly with my email there if you're at all interested in collaborating with us. Um, on this effort. And then I also linked the Space Scope website below. That is a very beta version. Um, we have really just started building up the website. So if you find links that will even work within the website, not a huge surprise because um, we really just started kind of consolidating everything. Um, but on this website, you're able to test out a couple of our beta versions of the app that I showed um, before. Uh, so with that, I would love to turn it over to questions. Um, and I will turn it back to the main session. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Liza. That was amazing. Um, just some really powerful visualizations and it's such a cool opportunity to kind of be on the ground floor of um, developing this new tool. Um, it's really cool, thank you so much. So I do have some questions both for you and for Dr. Dupini Giroux. Um, so let's, great. Um, and I don't think I introduced myself before. My name is Erin Griffin. I am the Youth Climate Program Manager at the Wild Center. And so I'm just gonna be, just we'll talk about a few questions we got from the audience um, just to close out today. And thanks again to you both so much for taking time out of your evening to share the amazing work that you're doing with us. Um, so just the first question, one that we got from Caroline. So thanks Caroline for submitting a question. And her uh, question was about the connections between COVID and climate change, which is something that you both touched on. And her question has to do with, you know, our lifestyles have changed so much um, due to the pandemic. And so many people are traveling less and just generally experiencing some pretty drastic lifestyle changes that are leading to a lot of us emitting less greenhouse gases. And so can, is that, you know, a net benefit for climate change? Like how, how do you see that affecting um, climate change, these changes in our lifestyle? So um, I started looking at this back in April and May when, you know, we started seeing those changes. And originally we had thought that, you know, we were living in the middle of this, this wonderful experiment that was all, you know, expenses paid. And what we realized is that the, the gases that are involved, um, they, they need to be factored in because something like carbon dioxide, even though less of it was emitted, because it's such a, a long-term gas, the actual net benefit was less than was previously thought. And then nitrogen dioxide, which is um, not as, as concentrated as, as carbon dioxide is, it responds quicker because of, of that influence, like I talked about with the weather um, conditions, but then it, it rebounds. So the, the short answer is that we're not seeing as much of a, a net benefit as we thought we were seeing, but we saw short-term benefits as a result of that weather nitrogen dioxide link. Thank you, Liza, did you wanna add anything? No, I think uh, Dr. Dupini Drew covered it for that one. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. That's really, that's interesting. And it's something that I've um, heard come up a lot and people are like, oh, like this is actually, you know, it's really helping the climate impacts. And um, it's something that I feel like is just some delicate wording. It's, it's hard to kind of make light out of something that is uh, so many people are dying from. So yeah, mm -hmm. thank you for that kind of that differentiation between the short-term and the long-term impacts. 
Um, both of you also touched on the um, differing vulnerabilities of people to climate change and just the fact that people who um, have contributed less to the impacts of climate change are experiencing the brunt of those impacts. And as scientists, I wonder if you could just talk about how that these justice and equity issues that are just totally interlinked with climate change, how that has impacted your work um, and how that's impacted even how you think about and talk about climate change. Liza, go ahead first and I'll, I'll come in. Sure. So, so far, a lot of my work thus far at NASA has focused um, primarily on ecosystem conservation and how we can prevent future diebacks of um, mangroves and other coastal ecosystems across the world. Um, but one kind of major factor that we're always facing is that we need to not only consider the needs of the ecosystem and the natural um, parts of Earth, but also the human system. Um, because fundamentally the two are continuously interlinked. When we're talking about conserving a local mangrove ecosystem um, on the coast of one particular country, in order to ensure success of that conservation project, we also need to work with the local community to make sure that they're fulfilling their economic needs as well. It can't be one or the other. Um, and so I think that's really reflected in the way that we need to increasingly think about climate change. We need to not only consider the climate impacts in terms of just sea level rise or just temperature rise, but also how those impacts will in turn impact the world's most vulnerable communities and how those communities in turn um, cause a continuous feedback loop and impact the climate itself. Um, so I think through my work, the, the biggest kind of takeaway that is that it's never just one or the other. Earth is a continuously interconnected system that we'll always need to consider all aspects of. Right. And so I actually, um, in my class today, we were talking about this because I think it's, it's one of my core values in terms of who has access to information. And so for me, um, when you think about climate literacy, you think about um, understanding and knowledge and then taking action as a result of that. Well, you can't take action as a result of it if you didn't have the information to start with. And so it starts all the way back at the, the sort of dissemination of the information and who is receiving it and whether they are receiving it, for example, in, in the way that they um, best process it, whether it's language, whether it's from a cultural norm perspective, whether it's from um, an appropriate um, perspective. And so how do you get the information out so that it's received in the manner that is most appropriate? And then how do you assist people in using that information? And so for me, vulnerability comes in so many different forms and, and part of it has to do with that, just the basic ability to access it. And then once you access it, can you use it, right? And so all of the things that we do to help visualize, to help spread, to help disseminate are critically important because it goes back to the basic thing, knowledge is power. Excellent, thank you. Um, so also I know we have a lot of high school students tuning in out there today. And I know for a fact that some of the students that have helped plan all these events are interested in climate science as you know, a potential career path. So I wonder if both of you could just speak briefly about how, like what brought you to climate science as a career, um, kind of what that path looked like for you. And if you have any advice for students out there that are looking at pursuing this as a career in the future, not, or pretty near future. <laughs> So I grew up in, in Trinidad, which is an island in the Caribbean. It's right off the coast of Venezuela. And um, it is part of the, the British system. So we actually had geography as, you know, when I was like yay high. So for, for me, um, knowing about the environment and learning about all this stuff is something that, that I was always fortunate to have done. And so, you know, I think back to whenever when somebody asked me that question, I'll be like, me, me, me. I was the one who used to sit next to the, the, the window because I had to see what was going on outside. And I had to make sense of the world around me, whether it was, you know, like where the rivers were flowing or how the, the clouds were forming. And then when I got to, to university, I sort of used that to help shape what I chose. So geography allowed me to, to do that. And then climatology allowed me to understand the, 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 the impacts of rainfall and temperature and soils and how they all fit together. And so 
um, words of advice. Uh, if you are fortunate enough to have geography in your school, take a class. If you are fortunate to have environmental science, take a class. And if you um, find that you have aptitude in math and physics, take those because those are what are going to get you to understand the, the sort of nuts and bolts underneath all the things that Liza was showing from a coding perspective. It's, it's all of the processes. So those would be my, my pieces. So my story kind of started um, when I was very young in elementary school, we had this uh, special program where they would actually take us on field trips to the local Chesapeake Bay. Um, and on these field trips, we were able to see with our own eyes how um, pollution was impacting the different fisheries and the health of the ecosystem, um, how humans and even our school was making their own impact um, on the health of the bay. And so that was really when I got started um, falling in love with environmental science, um, just because I felt like it combined my passions for um, both understanding policy and how humans impact the environment and also just looking at, at the natural world in and of itself. Um, and ultimately, I found myself going down the path of coding and understanding satellite imagery because I realized um, this is really the future of environmental science. Um, there's this famous quote, environmentalists don't sit in trees anymore, they sit in front of Google Earth. Now what people are doing is they're using satellites as a means of understanding these really global scale trends um, in terms of how humans are interacting with the environment. So I was really drawn to the aspects of, of satellite remote sensing as a means of just getting a better understanding of these trends that I was seeing on the ground. Um, and in terms of you know, pursuing a career in, in environmental science, um, I think as just sort of a general career advice, there are really two things that I found. Um, the first is that finding a mentor and finding your community are really, really important. Um, I definitely would not have been able to do any of the, the work that I showed you today without having a really great support system, both at, at NASA and all of the different institutions that I've worked at, um, who have continually been there to, to support me and to support my crazy ideas. Um, and just having these, these people who are always there um, to, to listen to you and to provide insight has been really critical. Um, and then I guess kind of along those lines too, is my second point, I would say really don't be intimidated by your lack of knowledge in the fields. When I first started working at NASA when I was 14, I, my knowledge of satellites was just that they were these rotating objects around the Earth. I didn't know absolutely anything about them. Um, and so I really just started from the beginning. And ultimately, if you have that support system and if you're passionate about uh, enough about what you're doing, then there's really um, not much of a limit in terms of where you can go. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I love how you both made the connection of how it started for you when you were really young and how it's something that has grown throughout your lives into the career that you have now. Um, I wish that we had like started everything with that. I think it's just such a great setup to everything that you were able to share today. So thank you both so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And I just want to do a quick shout out to the young folks that are listening out there today. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen. If you feel like you have a lot of thoughts today and you have a lot of questions and you have things that you still want to process um, from tonight's presentation, please join us this Thursday at 7. The link is in Sketch. So if you are registered for Youth Have Power, you'll be able to find that link. If not, you can still register um, to join us. And this will just be a space for all the, the young people that tuned in tonight to talk with each other and kind of bounce some ideas off each other and keep talking about all the amazing information and ideas that we heard tonight. So just a quick shout out for that. Um, I know it's been a long day, so we didn't wanna um, tack that on to the end of the day, but it's just Thursday's a couple days away. So feel free uh, to join us then if you wanna keep talking. So thank you both again so much and um, have an excellent night and we're just so grateful for the time and expertise that you shared with us. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good Have night. Great.